Howdy folks, welcome back to another video on structures. Today we're talking about the village hidden in the sand, I mean the lost library buried underground as seen in Avatar, The Last Airbender. As a building designer and engineer whose structures are, for the most part, not submerged in a sandy desert, I thought it would be a fun little study on the Majestic Library to think about what it is and how a building sunk into the earth can work, like what that means physically for an enormous structure to be submerged in sand, and how on the Avatar's green earth does Toph hold the dang thing up when it becomes swallowed by quicksand. So if that sounds like a good time or you like what we're serving up here, please consider subscribing. The support is much appreciated. And with that, onwards. At the library. Anyways, let's kick off this adventure by jumping into some lore. So the name of the place is Wan Shi Tong's library after the owl spirit that protects the great repository for all knowledge. It apparently was made many thousands of years ago, and I use the word made instead of built here because the library wasn't built per se, as its origins are in the spirit world, despite its location in the physical world. Now, for this video's purpose, uh, I want to pretend like I don't know that. Because I don't know anything at all about the spirit world. I don't know about any spirit world or spirit library or when it's floating upside down. I want to treat it like it's real because uh, I think it's more fun that way. Moving forward, let's jump into the primary source material. So, on the Aang Gang's vacation day, Sokka learns of this mysterious library's existence from an Earth Kingdom professor while at a lovely oasis in the middle of the Siwang Desert. With the help of Appa, and after 30 grueling seconds of looking for it, Toph spots a tower in the distance and the crew descends to investigate. And based on an old sketch of the library, Sokka figures out that this tower is like an iceberg. All we see is just the tip exposed above the sandy dunes. But the Aang gang aren't deterred, and thanks to Toph's non-destructive evaluation of the structure, finding it intact, decide to pop on in through the top of the spire to explore the cavernous library. The layout of the library orients itself around the square-shaped atrium that spans many stories tall, connecting each side of the building with crisscross footbridges. The atrium is wrapped with closely spaced columns, and these trefoil arches adorned with the face of the building's keeper, Wan Shi Tong. And he lets the gang do some exploring, we see some really tall library stacks over 30 feet high, and a domed roof planetarium that Sokka was particularly interested in, and uh, the big bird spirit didn't like that. Perceiving this to be a misuse of knowledge, he started a tremor that began to sink the library deep into the desert in an attempt to preserve his knowledge and trap the gang. But in comes Toph, who feels the vibrations in the earth, and to try and prevent the tower from sinking further, earth bends it, presumably, and succeeds, giving the team enough time to get out. Except for the professor guy, who is in the middle of like a really good book. Anyways, that's enough exposition from the story, let's dig deeper on the library's architecture. We just like architecture. So keen eyes may have recognized some pretty familiar shapes in the sketch passed around during the episode, and that it pretty closely resembles the Taj Mahal of India. The library would appear to have one primary dome, with several smaller domes surrounding it, a pair of minarets that flank each side, a central pointed archway that the Taj Mahal calls an Iwan, all seated on top of a series of arches and a plinth foundation. Foundation. And I know that The Legend of Korra gives us imagery of the library that kind of resembles the sketch, but this one feels like when you ask your parents for Wan Shi Tong's library, only to be reminded that you have Wan Shi Tong's library at home. But back to the Taj Mahal comparison, of course, the library does differ in some ways, and that its dome is a bit more of a pointed or catenary dome with an elongated shape in lieu of the bulbous or onion-shaped dome of the Taj. And for the record, I'm not just giving them fancy adjectives, those are technical names for the shapes. The library also includes many more domes, like partial domes, like domes on domes, which isn't only an artistic feature from Avatar's creators, though I mean, like, surely it is, but using subsidiary or partial domes to aid in the structural support is a common design approach we can see in examples like the Santa Maria del Fiore or Hagia Sophia, and generally in religious icons of that period. But otherwise, the remaining elements, the minarets, siwan, stylobate, and plinth, are all generally of similar form at least, and we can assume that the materials are comparable as well, which, and I hate to be the one to break the illusion, is not solid marble, but is some kind of brick and mortar with a thick marble cladding. So then making our way inside like the Avatar does, we'd enter through the finial up at the top through an open window, which I suppose can be a way to let light in or ventilate the space below, and the gang repels down through the top of the dome. Now, 
One thing we never see, and would be rather impossible to know, but it'd be rather typical if the library used an inner dome construction within the larger pointed dome. Both the Taj and the Florentine domes use this type of design, as it's said to be better for acoustics and brings the ceiling art closer to view. And this would seem to be borne out if we take the sketch at face value, because as the team enters the vaulted space, the dome appears rather flat, or at least certainly not all that pointed. Now, does this mean Cora's version is more accurate? with its more spherical dome. I can hear that comment already coming. I mean, analyzing architecture already feels like playing whack-a-mole. Sometimes I just need to make an assessment and keep going. Though, I mean, the same can be said for real engineering work to some degree. Now, as the end gang makes their way down, the professor drops an iconic line. Look at those beautiful buttresses. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, coming in from the top rope with the nitpick of the century, I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, I don't see any, and, and not just that, uh, buttresses while often used in creating these cavernous interior spaces in load-bearing construction, very common in Gothic architecture, and even the Santa Maria sports a few buttresses, but these are typically located on the exterior of a structure to support thrusts pushing outwards from something like a dome or barrel arch, and generally it seems like the method the sketched design uses to disperse thrusting loads is through those subsidiary domes. All this to say, the professor is probably mistaken, even if it is peak comedy. Then moving sequentially through the space, we arrive at what I've been calling the atrium. This is the open space that is created by the dome and is column free until we reach the perimeter walkways. However, rather than being totally empty, it has these crisscrossing bridges that allow for fast passage across. The walkways are quite interesting as they presumably span quite a distance with little visible structure. At first I thought this could be like a pony truss bridge with the handrails acting as the deeper structural members. But the trusses aren't continuous across and are broken up specifically because there are two Magic. Got it. Back to the atrium, we don't see the bottom of it, though it would seem to have at least five levels, or perhaps many more, of library corridors between the bottom of the dome and the base. Hey, so uh, editor's note, I'm just now realizing that the atrium in the escape scene has a totally different bridge than when we first entered, using a single straight span instead of that cross shape, as well as a different or maybe lack of ornamentation around the perimeter, presumably an animation shortcut since this is the same atrium that the gang escapes through. Just thought that was interesting. And while there are columns that adorn the perimeter of the columns, they're likely mostly ornamental as the dome's massive weight would crush these spindly little things even though they're spaced rather closely. Now, the corridors are kind of funny because they have the classic issue with animated architecture in that some views it would be like a normal story height of 15 feet or so, but in other cases is two to three times as tall, like when we see this view with library stacks fading into the darkness, which is epic, that would weigh like over 2,000 pounds every square foot, or sorry, in non-American units, a metric ass load. The last architectural space we see is the planetarium, which as a dome itself can perfectly fit into one of these smaller additional dome spaces or even the subsidiary domes, very convenient. Okay, so I've spent an inordinate amount of time trying to describe the architecture of a piece of media that despite nearly 10 minutes of description, we really don't know that much about. Now let's take this building and shove it underground. Now, designing buildings with underground spaces is a very commonplace practice. You know it's simple enough if a single-family residential home does this just to give themselves a basement. All it takes is protection from water intrusion and a sturdy enough wall to resist the pushed loads applied from the soils, which is dependent on soil type, though it can even be zero. And then, For example, I'll never forget parking in an underground garage in Nashville, only to look up and see bare rock in front of my car, no wall even necessary which I suppose if the bedrock is close enough to the surface and solid enough, you wouldn't even expect to have any lateral forces. But of course, that's not exactly the case with sand. Those lateral forces need to be designed for. If you were to take the average modern building and sink that into the earth, ignoring all of the water and electrical issues, most often you're dealing with non-structural walls made of wood or thin metal that are only intended to resist the local forces of wind, which at most is going to equate to only a couple of feet of soil. And this is not to mention any buildup of water pressure behind the wall, which is only additive windows and doors notwithstanding. Then if you were to take Wan Shi Tong's library, uh, what do we think? 
First assumption, and it's a big one, is that we've done a good job in filling doors, windows, and open corridors. Still, these domes and their stone walls will need to resist the weight of all the sand above, as well as the lateral forces generated by the sand. The weight above is pretty well understood, and in my award-winning video on domes, I noted that these are really good at resisting uniformly distributed loads coming down vertically, which is exactly what we have, though under potentially 100 feet of soil, with structural materials that have zero tensile strength, that will be problematic. Still, that shouldn't be the primary issue here. The lateral force based on the sand mechanics works, well, that gets a bit granular. Yeah, pun intended. So we all probably have our own good definition for what sand is, the stuff at the beach, right? Well, from a geotechnical perspective, sand is just one type of soil material alongside gravel, silt, and clay. These categories are mostly differentiated by size, with sands being in the range of about one millimeter. And that sounds quite small, but it's actually classified as a coarse-grained material because the sand particle sizes can still be over 1,000 times larger than the finest clays. So the mechanics for soil loadings on retaining walls can be dependent on either the cohesion of those fine-grained soils or the angle of internal friction for granular materials like sand. And there are a few theories for how these loads are applied depending on the configuration of the structure to be supported, but broadly speaking, the lateral force applied by the subsurface soils will be a linear relation of the weight of the soil and these coefficients of pressure, which are all dependent on the internal coefficient of friction. To use this to explain how the library begins to sink again, which is more akin to the phenomena of liquefaction, this occurs when moisture within the soil accumulates to relieve the soil particles of their internal friction and basically all strength. So you can see how the pressure builds up as we get deeper and deeper into the sand, and it wouldn't be impossible for some of the lower levels to give out under the high pressure and may be embedded in sand themselves. And I can imagine this not being entirely detrimental to the overall structure. Unlike water, sand infiltration lower on the structure wouldn't necessarily go on to fill the rest up as the sand can develop the strength to resist the incoming forces. However, if the overall structural were to be cylindrical, there's a decent chance something like this could work. As mentioned in one of my videos from over a year ago about underwater structures, cylindrical shapes are great at resolving high uniform pressures like what we would see with the library. With all the jumping and jogging and discontinuous elements I've sketched in plan view here, the opportunity for high stresses to accumulate would likely be the downfall. While there are some cool examples of modern brick walls acting as retaining walls for some small grade changes of 15 to 20 feet or so, the taller ones typically use something like rock anchors to do a lot of that work, which a building that was gradually sunk into the earth wouldn't have the luxury of applying. Or let's take a similar comparison, let's say that the applied soil loading is comparable to that of water, which, I mean, is reasonable. Think of how a dam's design is incredibly thick at the base, then the library would have little habitable space, or perhaps none at all. All this to say, it would take a very special structure to be sunk into the earth and remain intact. But we're not done yet. I did say that we were going to talk about Toph's feats of strength here, basically holding up the entire temple. So if we take this at face value, this may be more impressive than Uncle Iroh bursting through the walls of Ba Sing Se with a big ball of fire. Take for example what we think Wan Shi Tong's library might weigh in the range of, let's say, 200 to 500,000 tons if we used the Taj Mahal as a template. And while she likely doesn't have to support the whole of the weight as the library doesn't just go into free fall, she does arrest the falling library, and she does all this while fending off sand ninjas trying to steal their bison. Now, I know I don't tend to get into magical power systems in my engineering-focused videos because often these explanations end up being just go with it, but I think there can be a fun explanation here. So at first blush, this seems like she would need to be pulling up the full weight of the tower, all several hundred thousand tons of it, but that's not likely the case. Although there would be all of this sand sitting on top of the pedestal base to account for as well, however, the way Wan Shi Tong tries to swallow up the library, it would appear more gradual, meaning there is some support being provided, either from the soil below, but also certainly from the side friction of the adjacent sand. Whatever the number ultimately is, it's a big one. Now, could Toph support this tower, full hanging weight, from just this top spindly portion? Well, no, and for many reasons. 
a brick masonry spire has basically no capacity for resisting tension which would be required for the suspension from that one point, and even less so when you consider she's standing on top of the dome, presumably over the pedestal, which is supporting the sand she's standing on. That's like trying to fly by jumping and holding onto your legs. Now, on that note, the sandy surface should technically be sinking alongside the spire, but ignoring that, it would seem that Toph is not so much earthbending the building and lifting it up, but sandbending the subsurface sands to reapply friction forces sufficient enough to slow the sinking. Perhaps sandbending in a way that reconfigures the sand to be more dense, like what we see her do in this clip here, where she hardens the sand around her feet or creating a flow of sand that even acts as a force to raise the tower back up. Either way, I like the friction assumption it applies on the whole surface area, which gives a nice even distribution of those tension stresses across the whole exterior of the building, though the magnitude of the force required to do so is still enigmatic. But still, that's the real world explanation I can come up with, and I think that's a bit satisfying. Is it better than Iroh's? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, surely top two, though. So I hope you've enjoyed this little meditation on Wan Shi Tong's library and the physical implications on its quicksand related demise. As always, thanks again for watching, and don't forget to tell me what I forgot in the comments, and I'll see you in the next one. Adios.